The Change Your POV podcast and all of its shows within its network are working together to bring you the best coaches, entrepreneurs, business leaders, and mentors in every industry, teaching you how to crush it in life, love, wellness, and your transitions both at home and in your professional life. Imagine having a mix of experienced mentors teaching you their expertise, packing decades of research, experience, education, testing, and tough lessons into a concise curriculum. We've created the premier veteran transitional podcast anywhere. This is the show that we wished we had 15 years ago. And now this show is about you. And we are here to help you become just as successful out of uniform as you were when you were in. Our service members continually uh, surprise and shock me in their ability and their resiliency. You're absolutely correct. I, I see more guys that continue to serve under great adversity. And they do it for a lot of different reasons. But I will tell you that watching people that are that committed put their all into it and, and succeed for very inspiring, very inspiring. Welcome to Change Your POV Podcast Network. I am your host, Eddie Lazary, and I am on today with a very special guest, Terry Wiley, Command Master Chief, United States Navy, still active duty, looking to retire here shortly. And uh, he's doing some amazing things. I met him through a mastermind group, which is pretty cool. And I uh, got to know him a little bit, got to check out some of his artwork. And uh, I just had to bring him on the show and introduce him to everyone uh, on the Change Your POV Podcast Network uh, because, one, it's just really, really cool what he does. And I just got a lot of respect for his ambition and his direction post-military. And with that, Terry, welcome to the show. Thank you, Eddie. I appreciate that. So it, really quick, 30,000 foot, I mean, you've got, what, 30, we'll have 30 some plus years in by the time you retire. So it's kind of hard to, to kind of uh, summarize that in a, in a 30 second uh, pitch, but just kind of give the listeners a brief history of kind of uh, your experience with the Navy. Absolutely. Um, I joined the Navy from San Antonio, Texas uh, at the age of 23. And uh, that was in 1989. Uh, started off in the Navy as a molder, which is a foundry worker. Uh, they sent me to school for that and eventually became a journeyman molder and metallurgist and I uh, worked in repair facilities. Uh, I worked on uh, two repair ships uh, early in my career, the Amarius Land and then the Shenandoah. I became kind of what we would call a shop supervisor or LPO, uh, leading petty officer. After that, I went on to a journeyman school and got certified as a metallurgist, came back to the fleet where I uh, did a little bit more work on another ship, ended up going recruiting. I really enjoyed recruiting, did recruiting down in Houston, Texas. I was pretty successful at that, but while I was recruiting, the molder rate was uh, disestablished and uh, I had to pick a new job. So I went into damage control and in the Navy that uh, that's basically firefighting. I went on from there to a, a small ship, a frigate called the USS Simpson, and uh, that was a that was a great experience. Uh, we went on deployment with the USS Cole, and that's when uh, the Cole was hit. Uh, we were a uh, sister ship on deployment with them when that happened. From there, I, I got a split tour off of that ship and ended up on the USS George Washington and was promoted to chief petty officer, that's E-7. Uh, went to a few more schools, uh, became an instructor up at uh, Newport, Rhode Island for the Surface Warfare Officer School. Uh, moved on from there to USS Ashland, which was a uh, amphib, and that's one of the things I've loved about my career. I've gotten to do something you know, really different every few years. USS Ashland, I was in charge of uh, ballasting operations. We took on LCACs, Marines, did a lot of amphibious operations there. Uh, picked up Senior Chief or E8, and then uh, I went on to Barrier Firefighting School, the largest firefighting school in the East Coast. We put about 17,000 students a year through that schoolhouse. I was the director in charge of the school for about two and a half, three years. And that was one of my, probably one of my favorite jobs. I really enjoyed doing that. Uh, and I picked up Master Chief while I was there, which is E9. And I went on to the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower. At Dwight D. Eisenhower, I was the engineering department Master Chief. A great title, but uh, basically, uh, I equate it to being the building custodian. You know, 
I'll tell you more about that later. <laughs> but uh, it was a good job. It was a really good job. And uh, I learned a lot. And it's kind of what exposed me to command level leadership. And I kind of made the decision uh, to move into the command mass chief program which led me to uh, the Senior Enlisted Academy and eventually becoming the Command Master Chief of the USS Ramage, which is a DDG, a, a ballistic missile destroyer. I did a tour on there, did a deployment. That was a good one. From there, I went to the USS San Antonio, where I am now as the Command Master Chief. And I'm looking at retiring in about six months. So kind of a good deal for me. It's very unusual that you get to be the Command Master Chief named after the city that is your hometown. Yeah, that's really cool. You joined at 23, which I don't know if that's like from Navy standards, if that's a little bit late in the military, that's, that's a little bit late. Was that kind of like, was joining the, mil uh, the Navy kind of an afterthought or what, what happened there? That's a, that's a really good question. So my dad was in the Navy. Uh, it was something that I always had in the back of my mind as something I wanted to do, but I was busy being an artist. So I became a commercial artist. I went down to a local newspaper in San Antonio and volunteered to work for free and learned a lot about the business and got some experience and worked my way up into uh, the advertising department and doing some freelance work. I ended up working for an advertising agency out of Houston, Texas. It, it was it was good. It was doing well. But in the late 80s, there was a pretty significant recession. I went from uh, lots of job prospects to, to pretty slow and, and not very good prospects overnight. It just kind of led me back to wanting something with more stability. And uh, I was married. And I decided, you know what, maybe it was something I was going to try. And, and that's kind of what led me there. So, yes. At the time, uh, it was very unusual for somebody to join the military at 23 years old. Now today, we see a whole lot of people coming in in, in the military, uh, especially in the Navy, at 22, 23, 24 years old. Now, why do you think that is? Is that just because people try their hand at college and decide, uh, uh, they run out of money, so they go get the GI Bill? Or Absolutely. I think, uh, I think people want to try the opportunities in the civilian world first. And, and most of the time it involves trying to go to college first. So a lot of the, a lot of the sailors that we get in today have a year or two of, of college behind them. Some of them even have degrees. Uh, I've got two guys working for me right now that have uh, bachelor's degrees and they're enlisted. Dude, so the army has a, a program called green to gold where, where enlisted have the opportunity to have degrees, have an opportunity to go on to basically work, uh, to, to obtain a commission. Does the Navy have anything like that? Absolutely. Uh, we have a state 21 program, formerly the star program. And w there's a lot of opportunities for somebody with a degree that can apply for various programs. It depends on what the degree, degree is though. So that, yeah, there's definitely options, but be surprised. You know, a lot of the technical jobs in the Navy are, are enlisted jobs. A lot of people with degrees are willing to join the Navy and do the technical job as an enlisted person because it's about the experience. Mm. And then uh, and then they may use that experience. They may get out of the Navy and move on. Some stick around. So especially in our IT community and a few other places, uh, people are willing to do that. Right. And, and it kind of makes sense because you've got a lot of uh, technical MOS is in the Navy. I can imagine a, a good friend of mine is actually my son's best friend is in the, in the Navy active duty and he's a, a submariner. And so, you know, I can only imagine what that, what that must be like in, in the way that the technology has evolved over the years. Speaking of evolving over the years, you and I are, are among few veterans that I, that I know that were in the military pre nine 11 and then kind of lived through that as events transpired and then got to see a little bit how the military changed post 9-11. Give me your sense of that transition with the, uh, the state of the, the, the mindset of the Navy pre 9-11 and what 9-11 what did to kind of change things up uh, from your perspective. Uh, that, it's a tremendous topic. So pre 9-11, uh, when I first joined the Navy, we were, we were kind of riding high on the Ronald Reagan years of uh, expansion, and we were trying to build to a 
600 ship fleet. We were watching the Soviet Union in decline, and we were geared up hard for the blue water navy fight, which is you know, what we describe as uh, traditional naval combat. Uh, once you know, Soviet Union fell, and then we started dealing more with terrorist attacks, such as the terrorist attack uh, of the coal. And, and interestingly enough, but you know, each one of these I happened to be in close proximity to. Um, I was actually on the coal about two weeks before it got hit, doing a uh, something called the Damage Control Olympics off of the coast of uh, Yugoslavia. At that time, it was Yugoslavia. Now it's broke up into a bunch of smaller countries. But things changed dramatically after 9-11. We became clandestine warfare centric, and we started sending a whole lot of people on what we call IAs, individual augmentations, and they were sent to Afghanistan and Iraq, Kuwait, and a variety of places all around the world. The Navy supported several different ways those different missions. It definitely took our focus away from what we would call the Blue Water Navy or the what we would call the traditional naval uh, combat roles. Now, what we've seen, because we've spent nearly a decade focused on fighting wars in the desert, uh, we've seen a degradation of our, our abilities elsewhere. And now we want to get back to pre-9-11 uh, capabilities because now we're facing new threats around the world, including an emergent China Navy and, and new aircraft carriers that they're building, as well as new abilities in the Russian Navy and its resurgence uh, all over the Mediterranean and the Northern Atlantic and areas off of the coast of Africa. And then, of course, we're still uh, dealing with uh, Iraq, I'm sorry, Iran, and uh, Iran is an ever-present uh, regional threat in the Persian Gulf and the Arabian Sea. Uh, we're refocusing our efforts on more blue water naval tactics. So there's a lot of change happening in the Navy now. Do you think that's for the better, or do you think we're just kind of chasing events? Absolutely for the better. Um, I think we have to get smarter about this. I mean, let's, let's look at this. Uh, 80% of the world trade uh, transits the oceans. Mm, and yeah. China, China is building islands, and they are trying to assert their control over the South China Sea. They are trying to gain control of the shipping routes around the world, and they're actively pursuing this. Whether you want to talk about off the coast of Africa and their efforts in Africa, whether you want to talk about the South China Sea efforts, trust me, we are, we are in a global race of control for the movement of everything around the world via the seas. So right of navigation is one of our biggest missions, and it is a constant presence. So, you know, we are, we are out there every day of the week, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, keeping the shipping lanes open. Uh, ensuring that goods and services can freely flow around the world, also representing the United States and its interest uh, where it needs to be represented. And we do that on a daily basis uh, in direct confrontation with Russia, Iran, and China. Uh, and there's several other countries out there that we deal with as well. Of course, we have allies, and we do integrated events with, with all of them. So when you say integrated events, are you talking like uh, there'll be – some Australian ships to kind of cohort with your, your ships or, or integrated like you actually bring sailors from other countries onto your ships and vice versa? Both. Right now, oh. uh, yeah, right now I have uh, an officer from Chile who is, uh, has been on, on our ship for like a year now. And we kind of run an exchange program where we send an officer to Chile and, and we interact with their Navy. And then same thing, coming up here, in, in the near future, there's a training event that's going to involve several Northern European countries called Trident Juncture. It will be an amphibious event that will involve England and several other countries uh, in the North Atlantic. It'll last about two months, and it is definitely uh, an integrated event that will involve several navies. That's got to be really cool. I've had an opportunity to, to work with some international countries while deployed in Iraq, and it's interesting to see, you know, how similar we are, but yet how different we are at the same time, all the way from, you know, not just accent and, and culture, but, 
just the, in tactically the different things that the different countries are able to do and capable of doing given different technology and things like that. I, I can only imagine the same is true for the Navy, you know, being able to see the different applications of different technologies and the way things are, are operated and structured. I mean, a military is a military and you've got rank, you've got structure, you've got hierarchy, you've got all of that. But you take one nation and you, you stand them next to a different nation. There's a lot of differences. And I think that's good that you, you have the ability to kind of to, to mm-hmm. learn from each other, best practices. And it's got to take a lot of kind of letting your ego down to be able to uh, be susceptible to learning from someone else, right? Absolutely. And I think uh, when we work with these other navies, uh, I know we learn a lot and, and I'm sure they learn a lot. Uh, we learn what each other's capabilities are. We learn uh, what we bring to the mission, and it, it just makes us a stronger coalition in our ability to respond to uh, whatever's happening around the world. A couple of years ago, I was involved in, a, in an operation called Fruckus, kind of a great name, Fruckus. <laughs> but uh, it was a, a multi-international event where uh, we actually had the French, the Russians, and the English, and the Germans. And we all came together for training events and actually came here to Virginia. And I had all of those nations represented out at the fire school. And I got to see their different uh, firefighting tactics and methods. And we all learned a little bit from each other. It was very interesting. You're absolutely right. At the end of the day, we're all sailors. It's really interesting to see that how many similarities there are. If, you, if you're like me, you, you, you can't get enough military movies, and that may be what even inspires you in, in some of your pieces we might talk about in, in a little bit later. But uh, when I sit down and I watch a movie, and it's, it's uh, army-based, for example, it doesn't matter what era it is. It could be World War II, Vietnam, you know, Desert Storm, Desert, you know, whatever, Iraq. Um, I'm very critical <laughs> in the <laughs> way it's made and – and the things that they say and how they carry themselves and the equipment that they're using and the tactics, et cetera. Like I can't sit down and watch a, a military movie, especially if it's army or, or, or even Navy related, uh, not Navy, uh, Marine, Marine Corps related without kind of picking it apart. But I can sit down and watch a Navy movie. I mean, you know, granted there are certain Navy movies out there. It's like, like Pacific Rim or whatever with the aliens coming out of the water. Like I get that, but but like, you know, when we're talking other Navy movies, like I have no idea if, you know, I can't, I, I'm not as critical watching Navy movies and, and I'll be interested to kind of get your take on that. Like when you sit down and watch, oh, I don't know, Men of Honor with Cuba Gooden Jr. in there, um, you know, do you, do you take it in for what it is or are you kind of picking it apart too? we're absolutely critical of Navy movies. Uh, yeah. And it does get picked apart and, uh, it's a very common thing. We talk, we discuss it at length. Interesting. You bring up men of honor. Carl Brashear, uh, was a master chief Navy diver. And, uh, I was just at the Carl Brashear center this morning, uh, running with our, uh, chief selects this morning. And, uh, I was quizzing them on their knowledge of Carl Brashear. So a good movie entertaining they did a halfway decent job of of keeping it fairly real there's a lot of uh unfortunately not historically factual things in the movie so you know it makes it a little bit less entertaining when you're you know intimately knowledgeable of just like you are you know you watch an army movie it's gonna it's gonna throw you a bit but Mm -hmm. i still love them i still enjoy them but yeah we're definitely critical of I, I bring up that movie because it's it's got to be it's in my top five favorite uh, Navy movies and 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 I think it's more of the storyline I think it's the, uh, the the determination to never quit regardless um, of of what what comes your way what adversity you may you may be faced with and it's just unfortunate that that back then you know there was a lot of um, you know racial segregation still. Um, but you got these these pathfinders, these trailblazers that that uh, you know we now make movies off of. But they they really are kind of heroes in their own right because you know it's hard. You know it's hard to go up against the conventional military, uh, you know culture. You're you're told to do something. You just kind of stand in line, yes sir, no sir, and you just do it. But 
you know, to stand up against that, it's, it's difficult and you're ostracized a lot and, and it, it's very easy to kind of go with the flow. What is that saying? It, uh, you know, it's easy to, to, to choose the, the easy right over the hard wrong. Absolutely. Absolutely. Carl Bashir, fantastic sailor, regardless of whether, you know, he's uh, African-American or whether he's, it doesn't matter. I mean, he did uh, exceptional things and, and he's an inspiration to all sailors today. So we, we, we talk a lot about him and use him as a motivation tool, and leadership tool. I had the good fortune of meeting his son not too awfully long ago. He came and spoke at a Sailor of the Year presentation, and his son is an Army warrant officer, retired now, but uh, his son went into the Army. So we had some good spirited discussions uh, about Army and Navy sitting in the Carl Brashear Center, named after his father. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can only imagine. Wow, he's a great guy. It's a it's a great military family, and uh, and they have some incredible stories about their dad. It really brings it to life. Yeah, absolutely. And, and being allowed to you know stay in the Navy even even with an with an amputation kind of paved the way for you know what we now see today. There's a lot of of military service members that I know in, in the military and Marine Corps that have been able to extend or continue their service with, you know, with prostheses and, and, and continue to, you know, obviously their, their jobs change, the mission change a little bit, but, but they're allowed to, you know, before you'd, you'd get a, you know, an amputated limb, you're, that's it. You're, you, that you're done mel- medically discharged and you're out. Um, and that's still the case for, in most cases for a lot of folks, but there's a, there is a handful now that, that still do are able to continue to wear the uniform even, with a significant injury like that. So it's really kind of cool to see, I, I, I use that word loosely. It's not, it's not cool to see our, our service members injured or wounded, but it is, it is nice to see kind of how history is able to repeat itself today, right? Our service members continually uh, surprise and shock me in their ability and their resiliency. You're absolutely correct. I, I see more guys that continue to serve under great adversity and they do it for a lot of different reasons, but I will tell you that watching people that are that committed put their all into it and and succeed for very inspiring, very inspiring. So you're approaching your, your retirement. Well, first I got to ask, was it, was it your plan all along to kind of make it this far? and retire command master chief or did you just wake up one day it's like damn how did i get here you know uh, i i would say that it would be extremely presumptuous to be able to plan to do what what i was fortunate enough to do i i just you know i don't think that uh, you could sit at you know 15 years and say well you know i'm, I'm gonna be a command master chief and i'm gonna you know stay till i'm 30 it's just um it it does evolve and it becomes a series of fortunate opportunities uh, that you can leverage and, and take advantage of. I would tell you that it's a, it's a stack of cards that you, know, you couldn't predict. You just couldn't predict it. So I, I'm, I'm absolutely recognized that I'm extremely lucky and fortunate to be where I am today. And you know, the hard work of the sailors beneath me and around me, above me, have been the ones who contributed largely to my success. So uh, nobody gets where I'm at today on their own. Uh, trust me, they get a lot of help, and, and I had a lot of help. Uh, I'm thrilled to be where I'm at, but I'm also, you know, now it, it's it's coming to an end. Whether I want it to or not, it is gonna it is gonna end, and I have to make this transition. I will tell you, it's nerve wracking, um, you know. And I've been reading about it. I've been going to uh, what we call uh, GPS taps. I've been getting involved in veterans groups. And of course, I talk to a ton of veterans every day. Uh, the ship is currently in the shipyard and we have a ton of contractors and shipyard workers and a lot of whom used to be in the military. I talk to, to you know, leverage that uh, networking ability as much as possible and talk to everybody about what the potentials are. Yeah. Uh, even so, it's nerve wracking, you know. So, so be honest with me. What, as much as you can be, anyway. What's your take on the military's ability to successfully 
provide the knowledge, skill set, and know-how to successfully transition out of the military. Now, you know, handing somebody their DD-214 is, in, in my opinion, isn't a successful transition, right? It's people that are, are finally taking off the uniform for the last time that are able to succeed in a, as a veteran in, in a civilian environment uh, surrounded by people that, you know, they feel very uncomfortable with and around. Um, they, they may put on a good face in the morning, but deep down inside, they're thinking, oh my God, like, I can't believe I'm trying to uh, make a go at this. And I don't, I don't understand a lot of what they're saying and, and that there's a lot of folks that are, feel that the, the information that's provided is, isn't bad, but it's not everything that, that, that is advertised. And I just wanted to kind of get your take on it so far. Now you're six months out and you're beginning this, this transition. You probably began even sooner than that, which, which is good. I think the sooner or the more time you have to prepare and to plan a transition po- uh, pre-military will significantly increase your chances of success post-military. Those that try to do the 30 days before I ETS, you know, I'm going to sit through a, a four-hour TAPS class and call it a day, probably aren't going to have a lot of success. But I want to kind of get your take on your experience thus far. Well, I will say, you know, it's hard to judge because I haven't actually done the transition. But looking at it from my perspective, I think we should do more than what we do to prepare uh, our sailors for this transition. I can't speak to all branches of service. I think we're doing better than we have done in the past. So we definitely have recognized that we, we have not uh, really, this, this is a soft spot for, for the Navy. One of the things that the Navy's trying to do is uh, they've got a, a program out there called Sailor 2025, and it involves 45 separate initiatives. One, I mean, there's several of them associated with everything from changes in retirement to an ability to get out of the Navy for a while and then come back in, a whole variety of changes to preparation for getting out. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think some of those are good. I think in the long run, they pay off. Uh, But as of right now, I went through a week-long class. That's the official. And I went through the senior leader week-long class that's offered to Master Chiefs and 06 and above. And so I sat in a class with some admirals, some captains, and a few other mass chiefs, and we discussed this whole transition process. We had a whole variety of different guest speakers come in, and it's kind of drinking from the fire hose. You know, they, they give you a ton of information. You know, a lot of it seems foreign. They, we talk about resume writing, and you tell a whole bunch of active duty Navy members who are pretty senior you've got to go look for a job and you got to be able to do an interview and you got to be able to sell yourself and you got to be able to talk about what you do. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you, you can, you could see the near panic kind of come up in their eyes because you know, they, this is not something, this is not a skill set they've had to develop in the last 25, 30 years. They, you know, it's actually not a bad thing. And um, I feel like they gave us a lot of information. Now I've got a few other resources that I'm reaching out to as well. I found a good resource through the USO. And I plan on tapping into them because uh, I've had some friends who've used them to help them do everything from resume writing to actually hooking them up with um, interviews and job prospects and, and have had quite a few successes there. So uh, I definitely intend on looking at that as a possibility. But the other big possibility, quite frankly, is just talking to my networks mm-hmm. and uh, I'm, you know, different associates and friends. I have a pretty extensive number of friends. And most of them tell me the same thing. Most of them tell me uh, that most companies don't really want to talk to you until you're, you have that DD-214 in hand. You know, they, if they do talk to you, it, it's, eh, it, you know, m- more like a get to know you kind of thing. It's not, it's not, uh, you're not, they're not going to hire you until you have that DD-214. So once you have that, then it's kind of a, uh, you know, especially in this area where I'm at, it's so heavily saturated with uh, of people in the military. You know, when you think about it, the number of aircraft carriers we have here, the size of the base we have here, the Naval Air Station we have here, you, there's hundreds of thousands of active duty military here. That's probably one of the biggest challenges you have is that um, you're in competition for jobs out there. And there's a lot of people just like you transitioning out of the military looking for those jobs. 
Yeah, you, you bring up a good point. You get, you get large military installations. I I retired at, or ret- I got out of the out of the army out of the largest wow. army base at Fort Hood, Texas, right in the central Texas there, uh, north of San Antonio and Austin, and uh, you know two two full size divisions and a a core element, some other elements on there. So significant military base, and and that's then that's exactly what you're talking about is 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 true for that area. You can't have everybody separating from that military installation and all fine jobs in and around the city that that military base supports. It just, it's not structured that way. Um, of course, a lot of people go back home, wherever back home is, but a lot of people, you know, especially if they've done a considerable number of years in any one location, they, they kind of call that now their home and they've got family and friends and, and extended family and things like that. And you grow roots, right? And so you, you want to stay in that area, but you're right. You get all these people that are trying to get out and uh, all are, you're very competitive. Uh, one of the questions that I have, and, and I like to ask this because I've had an opportunity to speak with well, now probably thousands of veterans. And, and I, I tend to ask a lot of the same questions just to kind of get a pulse. And that is, and, and I understand you haven't quite transitioned yet, but you're, you're well in your way of, of at least thinking about it and putting yourself in that, in that, the correct mindset ahead of time. Uh, what's the one thing that you feel like you are struggling with or will be struggling with once you transition when it comes to your transition? I, I'll, I'll tell you what the number one answer is that I've heard, but I would like to get your take on it before I give, give up the answer. Okay. I, I absolutely know what that is. It's the, it's the single biggest challenge is in talking to all these different sources, getting, sitting through all these classes, that what you get told multiple times is that you have to focus in on a specific job, a specific thing that you want to do. Um, so you need to go apply for, you know, whatever this might be, you know, now, here, here's the problem for somebody like me in the last 30 years, oh, I've done 50 different jobs. Uh, there's no job in the civilian world that, that is equivalent to what I do. So I don't know what to ask for. I don't know what to, I don't know what the civilian options are. Uh-huh. And so when they say, Hey, what, what do you want to apply for? What do you want this resume to be uh, driving for? It makes it a real challenge for me because I don't, I don't know what job to even ask for. So researching companies and job positions and reading job descriptions of what's out there. And a lot of times I feel like the job descriptions are totally misleading. It makes it difficult uh, to know, hey, well, this is what I want to do. And this is the kind of company I want to go to work for. And this is the, the field I want to work. You know, I can, I can kind of get down to a field. You know, if you were to ask me to describe what I do in the military, it would probably cover 25 different civilian jobs. Right. Uh, so it makes it very difficult to narrow it down to this is what I want to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the, the number one answer that I get when I talk to all the folks that I've had the, the, the opportunity to speak with, and it is basically it's, is right on point with what you're talking about. It's the, it's the ability to convert their military experience into terminology that the civilian world will not only understand, but find value in. And that's what you're leading to, right? Is you've got all these military Absolutely. experiences and you know that there's qualities that other non-military organizations will find value in, but you're not entirely sure what those are, number one, and how to articulate them, number two, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we love acronyms in the Navy, you know? Mm-hmm. And yep. uh, so I could, I could talk to you for in complete paragraphs using nothing but acronyms and nobody have a clue what I'm talking about. Yeah. I feel like that's going to be a real struggle at times. Uh, although I hear from a lot of, a lot of people that have gone before me and made these transitions is uh, there are people out there like you that help guys like me make this transition and will help interpret until I get my, you know, for lack of better term, sea legs or dry land legs, you know, and, and I'm able to function in the civilian world. You know, I deal with a lot of civilians now, but they are, they're burst in, you know, Navy speak and they're, mm-hmm. they're burst in, in understanding us. I think it's going to, it's going to be a bit of a transition. I think especially if I left this area, it would be a bigger transition. Yeah, that's absolutely true. The further you get away from the, the military infrastructure and, you know, out into the, the rest of the world, 
the, the harder it becomes, your, your networks become smaller, the, uh, the, the number of civilians that understand the vernacular and the jargon and, and the way things uh, work and operate from a military standpoint to kind of dwindle. Uh, I experienced that. I moved from, like I said, the largest army base in the world to New Hampshire, which has got like, you know, we do have a, like Port Smith is pretty, pretty sizable, but I live like, I don't know, two and a half hours from there. So it's not like I'm in, in the, any kind of community or anything like that. So that's one of the things I totally took for granted is just completely being stripped of all of, all of my network, my military network, you know, the people that I just come to rely on and knew that they were there if I ever needed them. And that was all gone. And it was very difficult. And all the jobs that I was applying to were all corporate positions. And there were some veterans that worked in them, but they were, you know, old school veterans that were so far removed that, you know, they really didn't understand a lot of the vernacular and jargon that I was, was talking to them about, you know, in, in today's day and age. But, uh, but so, you, you know what, you're right. You've got a lot of uh, resources available to you. Like me is, is one. It's one of the things that I specialize in, I guess, if you want to call it that, is the ability to transmit or translate your military experience into civilian terminology that, that corporate hiring managers, recruiters will not only understand, but find value in. Um, I teach that in uh, local colleges, universities to veteran students. And I also do that. Uh, for mentees on a, an amazing mentor platform called Veterati. So if you've never checked out Veterati, I'll put the link to that in the show notes page of this episode. Uh, highly recommend you go check that out, everybody listening, but also you, Terry, if you haven't done so. Highly, highly <laughs> encourage you to check out Veterati. What I think is absolutely amazing, and that is... Yes, you're a command master chief. You've done amazing things throughout your, your journey and your career. But one of the things that you kind of brought along with you throughout your career, and you kind of alluded to it at the very beginning when you, you know, before you, you didn't join the Army or the Navy right out of, out of high school, you went and, and, and dabbled in some art. And you've kind of, I think, done that pretty much. You're, you're at least on the side. And now you're really kind of kicking it in in high gear with this amazing platform called Master Chief Paint Locker. And for those of you that are curious out there, you can go check it out at changeyourpov.com forward slash MC Paint Locker. It stands for Master Chief Paint Locker. Again, it's changeyourpov.com forward slash MC Paint Locker. On that page, you'll be able to uh, see some different examples of his artwork. There'll be a link that will take you to... Uh, his his site where he's got some pieces uh, prints for sale and also his um, YouTube page where you can watch him actually do the drawings and you've got some amazing um, time lapse videos going on of, of you uh, sketching out and drawing and and uh, and coloring in these these amazing pieces of work um, so tell us a little bit about the Master Chief Paint Locker, how it started, why it started, and what you're doing with it today. Absolutely. So art has always been a passion of mine. It's been uh, a stress reliever over the years, and it's been a way for me to kind of, you know, do something other than just completely military all the time. And um, so I've kept one foot in it. I've, I've done a variety of different things, oil paint, uh, watercolor, pencil, all kinds of mixed media Uh, and I've done computer graphics. I started off just doing really basic things. I worked for a a publishing company called Hardcore Brace and Jovanovich. I don't don't even think they're in business anymore, but they used to do uh, textbooks. So one of the the jobs that I had early on was drawing pictures for uh, standardized tests, and I drew a lot of scientific pictures and things like that. So I've been doing this for a long time. Now, while I've been in the military, I just, I did it for as a hobby and for fun. I really don't want to go back to working for an advertising agency or anything like that. It's not something I'm really interested in. It's not the kind of, I don't get a whole lot of joy out of doing that kind of art. Uh, What I do get a joy out of is doing art that is military related. I've been doing a a variety of different uh, art series uh, that kind of depict uh, military or Navy life specifically. I've got one called the Old Salts. It's a black and white line art that uh, depicts sailors from uh, the 1800s 
uh, they're based on actual photographs. They're, they're well-known photographs, you know, but this is a artist rendering. So a little bit different interpretation, you know, I kind of bring a little bit of my own saltiness to it. And, and I think it translates in the art. So I think, you know, one of the things wh whenever you're doing something creative, if you do something you love, number one, and if you do something in your life, number two, it's going to translate into the art. And I, and I think it does for me. I get a lot of great feedback. People really enjoy looking at the art and, and even having some of the art, you know, putting it on their wall, enjoy it. I'm a big proponent of art on walls. <laughs> uh a lot of people these days want their art on their body, which is good, you know, that every man to himself, which is an interesting side note, 30 years in the Navy and I don't have a tattoo. Not even a little anchor on your ankle? No. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no, don't have anything like that. I, I get a lot, a lot of guys asking me, hey, draw this for my tattoo. And, uh, you know, I tell them, hey, you know, if you want to adapt something, go ahead. But, uh, you know, I, I like the art on the walls. Yeah. Um, I did the old salt series. Uh, I, I really just did it for myself. It was something I wanted on my own wall. And as soon as I showed it around to a few people, um, uh, you know, they wanted copies of it, which kind of started me thinking, well, if I can do the art I really enjoy doing, people are interested in it, then, you know, that has a potential for some kind of income. You know, I thought, well, let, let's look at the fine art business rather than the commercial art business. I started doing more work. So far, uh, like I said, we just started. It's only been a few months. There's been a tremendous response. People are really interested. Uh, I've had a lot of requests for commission work. I've done a couple of commissions. Uh, I like doing portraits, too. My uh, pencil portraits uh, turn out really well. I've done a few portraits of Medal of Honor winners, done a, a few portraits of officers who've you know, commissioned me. There's pros and cons to commissions. I like working with individuals and coming up with something they, they really want. And it's, it's good. But the thing that people, I think, misunderstand about art is the amount of time invested in it. So time is money. A lot of people want uh, a really sophisticated piece of artwork, but they want to pay cartoon prices. Uh -huh. So, you know, the, the whole element to this that makes it worthwhile for me to do is selling the print side of it, which is, you know, kind of bumps, bumps up the income potential and makes doing the art, you know, worth spending the 50, 60 hours that I invest in doing a piece in. It's, it's so far, it's, it's been pretty good. I mean, it's, it's definitely not, you know, something I'm going to retire on tomorrow, but uh, it has potential and it's growing. You know, what I really enjoy is I really enjoy listening to veterans tell me how much that piece of art took them to a place in time and gave them a feeling and reminded them of, of an emotion. And it's all positive stuff. It's all good things. You know, I, I love doing the ships at sea. And my most recent piece is the Dwight D. Eisenhower transiting. It, it's, it's, you know, moving along. Aircraft carriers can, can go pretty fast on the water. I'd say it's probably doing close to 35, 40 knots. It's kicking up a little bit of a bow wave and uh, there's aircraft on deck and, and you can see an F-18 in the sky and you can see it's uh, it's chaser DDG behind it. And it, and it just has a, an element of uh, what it feels like to be at sea. And, and not a lot of people get to experience that. But once you do, it is something you will never forget. It's something that, it's an emotion that uh, you have very strong ties to. So uh, I think that's what I like the most is watching people's emotional reactions to my art mm -hmm. and, and, and sharing it in that way. The, the work is just absolutely amazing. And I'm looking at the, uh, the, uh, the, the piece that you did on the Ike right now. And my eye, every time I look at it, my eye is drawn into probably the smallest figure on the entire drawing. And it's that, it's that uh, that guy that's that looks like he's uh, tying down the the, uh, the rotors of, of a helicopter. That's what it looks like he's doing, and he looks like he's kind of straining against uh, maybe the, the the wind or the breeze, or or maybe straining against the, the the rope or cable that he's pulling out there. I'm not sure if that's what he's doing, but that's what it looks like that he's doing to me. And and perhaps I kind of my eye draws into that uh, more than anything else on the ship because. I see a lot of the of uh, my military my military experience in that because I was a I was a forward observer and was in, inserted a lot by helicopter did a lot of insertions and 
And so getting on and off a Black Hawk hel helicopter is, is one of the, you know, more fond memories that I have of my time in service. So to, to, I'm looking at a ship, but all I see is a look like somebody egressing out of a helicopter. <laughs> yeah, it's absolutely, uh, he, he does, I, I would grant you, he looks like he's doing a tie down, but he's not. He's actually just walking across the deck and uh, it's a really good illustration of how hard the wind blows across mm -hmm. the deck of an aircraft carrier. So, but yeah, absolutely. And, and everybody sees, or, you know, that's one thing I enjoy about doing the art is the, the details. Uh, yeah. So my art has a lot of detail in it. Sometimes it's called hyper-realistic or uh, realistic artwork. So it's not impressionistic. If you, if you, if you look at my art, you're going to see pretty well detailed work. And what a lot of people tell me is every time they look at it, they see something different they hadn't noticed before. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's, it's striking, definitely a presence type piece. It's something that will stand out. So if you put it up in a room, you're definitely going to notice it. And I'll, um, be, I'll be honest with you. The first time I saw your work, I, I just saw images. And when I first saw the images, I thought, I, I, I didn't think that they were actual drawings. I thought they were computer generated, you know how you could take a picture and kind of throw mm -hmm. some filters on there and make it look like a, sketched image or whatever you, just amazing things that people can do with with uh with photographs these days with all the different tools available to us now at virtually no cost if any cost at all and so that's what i first thought it was and then i caught uh, one of your videos there on youtube on the master chief paint locker and it actually has you sketching it out in, in the time lapse video of watching you actually draw draw this this image of this aircraft carrier i was like oh my god like i was completely taken back by just the intricate detail now for the listeners out there that the it was difficult about a podcast is trying to paint an image or a picture into the uh into the mind's eye of the listener since this is just a an audio medium but i, I love art i i do obviously I, I dabble in it compared to you uh, but I do painting and I do some sketching, but nothing to the scale that you that you do. But I do have a a, a huge fascination uh, with art and artists and just the creative that is art. I'm just curious for my own my own reasons. How do you like? How do you select? Like, let's talk about coming up with an, an idea or a concept for a, a piece of work, and then where do you go to source the imagery? Is it pictures you take yourself? Is it just from memory? different pieces or you take multiple pictures or kind of integrate them in the one and and then like how's your process in terms of in drawing it out from background to foreground is it dark to light like uh just give us a little bit of more of the technical side of of how you do this work the process is a little bit more involved than a lot of people think what i what i first start doing is kind of conceptualizing what i would like to do uh and i'll give an example i did a I did a ticonderoga class cruiser I knew I wanted to do the so cruisers are traditionally kind of top heavy and they and they roll pretty heavily. So I wanted to capture a cruiser maneuvering and rolling. Uh, I knew that you know, sailors would immediately relate to that and it would bring it home in a very visceral sense. So I started researching images. Uh, I go on different websites. The Navy does a whole lot of photography and there's several, you know, combat camera. There's several uh, websites and several resource places out there. I found, you know, probably four or five different images of the cruiser that I liked, you know, in different angles. And so what I'll start doing is uh, I'll, I'll take those and I'll start sketching out my idea for what I want. And in this case, what I wanted was a cruiser that was making a port twist to align for flight quarters. And I wanted the flight crew out on deck so that you could see visually how much they're leaning into the turn uh, as the ship's making a hard left turn, a hard port turn. You know, it, it leans really heavily to starboard and it's probably got about a 15 degree roll on it. That's kind of the concept. I sketched it out several times, kind of came up with different angles that I wanted and then did a pencil drawing, uh, got it to scale that I wanted it at. And then I basically erased the pencil drawing down to almost uh, barely visible. And then I start the inking process. Now, obviously there's, you know, I could paint this in oil or I could, but I'm, I really enjoy the inking process and the quality of image you get from ink. Like you said, it almost looks computer generated and it gives it more of a, almost a surreal sort of presence. You know, I could get, I could get a similar effect in oil, but I think the ink right now is, is just something I'm really enjoying working with. 
And so I go start inking it out and I'll use a variety of different pens. Um, I use Copic markers, uh, which are alcohol-based marker, and it's a blendable marker, so I can blend the colors. And like a lot of markers that you get, you know, you, you put a, a line down and then you go over it with something else and, they, and those two won't blend at all. Copic markers will blend, it, it'll start, you know, you can show a gradation of hue and color. I use the Copic markers for shading and blending and shape and structure, uh, and then I'll use more detailed pins like stablo pins that give me real fine points and do the fine detailed work. I also use pit markers from Faber Castle, which they're not alcohol based. So it's kind of uh, just knowing when and where you want to use this. You want to stay the color fast and you want it to be, you know, what you put there stays there. Then I'll use a pit marker. And there's different tips I use. I use brush tips. I use fine tips. I use broad tips. I use a whole variety of different types of applicators. I also use uh, Posca paint pens or Posca markers. They're semi-opaque and they enable me to go over the top of already existing images and do highlights and things like that. You know, just a variety of different effects there. I could also blend in some watercolor and if I need real delicate sort of transitions and things, then I can go at it with uh, colored pencils and get a, a real detailed sort of finish, almost get it looking. In fact, it, a lot of people think it looks a little bit like a photograph. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you can get it down to that. It, you know, can absolutely look photorealistic. There's two things, there's two qualities about your work that I pick up on as an artist, fellow artist that I, that I know, that I know are, a challenge to get right because if you don't get them right then it will throw off your whole piece uh the, the first one is shadowing and making sure you understand where the light source is and making sure that that all of your your shadows are consistent because if you're you know like i'm looking at that cruiser image right now where you got the uh the guys that are out on the i don't know if you call that a deck or whatever is that like a landing yeah. pad for a helicopter or something it is it's a flight deck yeah okay so they're they're standing out there but you can see underneath the uh, the sun's rays have are, are kind of mm -hmm. shining through the deck, and uh, and it's casting a like bar shadow um, on the on the side of, mm -hmm. of the um, underneath side there, and then you can see that that shadowing angle is consistent throughout the piece, which is not easy to do. I'll tell you that. And then the other <laughs> thing that uh, that I find difficult when I'm doing uh, I do primarily oil painting. Um, but one of the things that is very challenging for many artists is uh, getting the water to lay, to actually lay flat like water lays flat on the earth. Any water feature, whether it be a stream, a lake, a creek, an ocean, or whatever, if done incorrectly, it basically it looks like it's standing off the page and not, and not a cohesive unit in the rest of the imagery. And you do an amazing job with the water. And now it could be just that many years out on, out on the water and you know exactly what it looks like. But uh, amazing work, guys. you got to go and check this out. You can head on over to changerpov.com forward slash MC Paint Locker. It stands for Master Chief Paint Locker. Again, it's changerpov.com forward slash MC Paint Locker. There will be links to the, uh, the shop where you can go and uh, purchase a print. It looks like you've got uh, what was that, four pieces of work right now up on the uh, on the yeah. shop you've got the uh the haze gray you've got the uh, the ship at sea which is one we were just describing you got the old salts with mm -hmm. those uh old timers sitting around um looks like they're complaining about their uh, command master chief i don't know <laughs> and then and very then, likely yeah very likely and then you got the uh, the other one looks like an older uh, 18th century uss i'm gonna butcher that what is that weekend that is actually the enterprise um it taken in, I want to say 1887, but yeah, it is actually an image of the Enterprise. Wow, amazing. And how long does it take you to do the original pieces? John average, I know you got different sizes and different styles and coloring may take you a little bit longer, but just on average, how long does it take you to complete a piece? Most of my images are done at about uh, 24 by 19, pretty close to that. I spend close to 40 to 50 hours on each piece. That's a big. That's a big piece. That's not a tiny. That's not an eight and a half by eleven. Throw it on your wall. That's like yeah. an actual. That's legit right there. And so you you Absolutely. go and you 
you get these pieces uh, professionally photographed and have them uh, marked up and ready for printing so you can sell them as prints. Is, how is that process? Is that, is that an easy process? Is it a difficult process? Like, what's that about? It's extremely challenging. <laughs> uh, again, that's, that's still part of the artist process because uh, I work with another artist who now uses his talent to photograph the artwork. And, you know, that's a challenge, getting the lighting right, getting everything exposure correct. And, you know, it's, it's actually harder than it sounds. And then um, he takes that, he does his work processing the image. We print it on a vellum, heavy paper. It's, it's 140 pound stock paper uh, with a vellum finish. It's watercolor paper. It's actually mm -hmm. artist paper. And so it's archival paper, absolutely designed for what we're using it for. He uses an incredibly high resolution uh, printer to, to print the image onto the paper. Comes up with uh, an incredible print. And in some cases, uh, I've had, you know, the print sitting next to the real thing. And occasionally I've said, you know, that print almost looks better than the real one, the real picture. Hmm. Uh, it's amazing how well they look. And then, like, a, I do a limited number. I don't do, you know, an unlimited number. I do a, a, a limited number, and I sign them and number them. And so you'll know exactly what number and signature you have. And, and then once it's sold out, it's, it's it. It's done. Uh, you either have it or you don't. Hopefully, you know, people will get one if they're interested. So are the, uh, the prints <clears throat> same size as the original, or are they scaled down? The largest print, you know, that you could buy is usually the same size as the image. So the carrier, the carrier print, the uh, Ike print that I'm doing, uh, it, the actual uh, original is 30 by 20. And so I'm going to do a 30 by 20 print. And then, uh, and then I'll do smaller prints on top of that. So wow. for each piece of art, whatever, whatever the largest size is, that's the size of the actual image. That's amazing. And you're selling these prints right now for $35 a piece, which, my God, man, that is, that's a steal as far as I'm concerned. I can't imagine that you're making a whole hell of a lot in markup given the, given the, the quality of paper and the, the printing technique and, and whatever your, uh, your guy you know, charges to do that and just the you know, cost of goods and things like that. I just can't believe you're selling them for $35 a piece. So here's what we're going to do here. Well, what I want everybody to do, um, this is going to be releasing this weekend on Labor Day weekend. Terry's doing a hard launch of the Master Chief Paint Locker and, and wants to get a word out. And, and I definitely wanted to be a part of this. And he's got an amazing YouTube channel. The link will be in the, to the YouTube channel will be in the, the link that I provided to you, which I will provide you here again in a minute. Um, but this is what we're going to do. So this episode's coming out this weekend. Um, what I would like you to do is go to changerpov.com forward slash MC Paint Locker and look for the link that says Master Chief Paint Locker YouTube channel. What I want you to do is I want you to go over to his YouTube channel and I want you to, number one, I want you to subscribe. That's the first step. And number two, I want you to leave a comment in the comment section, section and you can leave whatever comment you want. But what I'm looking for is hashtag CYPOV, hashtag CYPOV in the comments. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna be collecting all of those names of folks that are leaving the hashtag CYPOV in their comments after they've subscribed to the YouTube channel. And on September 30th, I will hold a, a drawing of uh, however many people participate, that's how many chances uh, that you have to win. So um, I, I, the more the merrier, I hope. I hope we get more than, than a handful. I'm going to push to get as many as we can possibly get. But on September 30th, I'm going to do a Facebook Live. I'm actually going to come on with Terry that Sunday, and we're going to announce who the winner is, and they are going to win a, a print of their choice. So one of the four prints that are up on the shop right now, courtesy of the Change Your POV Podcast Network, uh, you can go on there, let me know which one you want and what address to send it to. And Change Your POV will uh, send that off uh, to you, to wherever you, wherever you live, wherever your home is. So that's, that's the deal. Go over to changeyourpov.com forward slash MC Paint Locker. 
Find the link to the YouTube channel between now and September 30th, 2018. So if you're listening to this episode after that, then uh, you can still go to there and you can still subscribe and leave a comment, but you just won't be part of the part of the drawing of the free print. Uh, but yeah, subscribe, leave a comment, leave whatever comment you want in there, but make sure you use the hashtag CYPOV, which of course stands for change your point of view, hashtag CYPOV. And on September 30th, I will collect all the names of those that have participated and we will draw a winner. How does that sound? That sounds fantastic. I think it's a, it's a great idea. All right. Very cool. Terry, thank you so much for being a guest on uh, the Change Your POV Podcast Network. It was, uh, it was great to hear your story. And I have the pleasure of getting to talk with you uh, every Monday in our mastermind group, which I'm very thankful that your brother put together. So tell him thanks for me. And, uh, and stay tuned, folks, because my plan is to get everybody in our mastermind group onto this podcast at some point here in the future. And you get to hear about what they have going on in, uh, in their lives. And we've got some amazing, we got a, I would have to say we got a, quite a cast of characters. I might, if I'm, it's, it's, if I'm in the group, we definitely have a cast of characters. Let's just say that. But uh, amazing group, and I think they're trying to bring in a couple more people. We're trying to limit the mastermind to around eight to ten people. Um, any more than that, and it turns into something that resembles herding cats, which isn't fun. <laughs> so uh, with that, Terry, thank you so much for your service. Good luck on your transition. And uh, let me tell you, you, you got a lot of sailors out there that are going to sure to miss you. I, I guarantee it. Um, thank you for what you do with the continuing to provide the amazing work that you do uh, with your artwork. It's definitely a, a skill that um, we just, the world would be not be a, a, a as great a place without it. So thank you for that. And it's amazing. And if you want to go check out those videos, you can do so now. You got some amazing videos of him actually doing artwork. And he explains some of the how to's behind kind of the, the peek behind the curtain, if you will. And uh, he's posting new videos up on there all the time. So go check them out. Don't forget, head over to changerpov.com forward slash MC Paint Locker. Subscribe to the, uh, or find the link to his YouTube channel. Subscribe, leave a comment, any comment you want. And be sure to hit the hashtag CYPOV for your chance to win one of four prints on September 30th. All right, folks, until next time.